Last year, I did a video on the captivating documentary photography of Tish Murtha, who was in Newcastle upon Tyne in the late 70s, early 80s, taking and making photo stories with the kids who were hanging out in the streets during the day. And this was a time when the economy of the country was really struggling and it was hitting hardest those poorer communities and especially those kids who didn't have a bright future ahead of them because they weren't sure they could get work. And her images sparked conversation. But even while I was scripting that video, I was thinking to myself, wouldn't it be great to talk to somebody who is actually doing this work today, who is active now in this sort of documentary photography that hopes to draw attention to important causes. And it took me a moment to realize it, but I already had the ideal photographer sitting in my bookshelf. The book is called Small Town Inertia, and the photographer in question is Jim Mortram. And he is a photographer who today is doing that sort of documentary photography that tells us visual stories in the hopes that it will draw attention to worthy causes and people who need their voices amplifying. Now, I want you to hear from Jim directly about what it's like to do this sort of photographic work and what his approach is. And normally when I make these documentaries, I'll travel to the photographer, set up a couple of cameras and some lights and audio, and go around and film a bunch of B-roll and cut together something that looks and feels like a, hopefully a well-produced documentary. But in this case, in our world of pandemics at the moment, you'll hear from Jim that he is in fact a primary carer for his sick mother. And in this case, we just couldn't meet one-on-one. -on -one. He's shielding, he's been isolating himself since March of last year to protect his mom and her health. And so we couldn't meet up and we needed to find another solution. So because it's hard to predict things and we didn't really want to wait anymore, Jim and I had a chat on Instagram. We thought, why not let's just try and record this over Zoom, which we did. So that's what you're gonna see. And yes, some of the footage doesn't look that great and it's grainy and messy and there's gonna be some digital delay at parts and the audio is not always that brilliant, especially because Coda, Jim's dog, is chewing a bottle in the background sometimes, but I don't think any of that matters. Because you're gonna hear from a human being with a huge heart, full of empathy and full of courage. And because of that, you're also gonna get an unflinching view of the hardships many people face on a daily basis and what it takes in those situations to be an effective and compassionate documentary photographer. I'll give you a heads up that there are some tough topics covered in this video, but I make no apologies for that. This is real people's lives, and hopefully you've clicked on this video because you're interested in documentary photography, and if you wanna either take in documentary photography or maybe become a documentary photographer one day, you are gonna to have to face the shadow side of life. But you're also gonna get a glimpse of the power photography has to bring hope and amplify voices that need it, and to help those in society who feel unseen to finally feel seen. So I'm gonna shut up now and let you hear from Jim Mortram. So I found my way to photography in a fairly untraditional path. I was studying painting uh, art school in Norwich, which is about 40 miles from where I am. Pretty consumed with the idea that I was gonna be a painter. Um, I'd left home, what, the two years prior to go study uh, and was pretty deep in my degree course when I was getting phone calls from my father, my mother, who'd been ill during my childhood and my teenage years, got dramatically worse. And I found myself in a situation where I was torn between continuing my studies uh, and being, I guess, quite selfish. Uh, I'm an only child, it's important to add, um, or going home and helping. And my dad had had a nervous breakdown through the stress and mum was, uh, in a lot of physical pain, a lot of mental pain, and had become bedridden. And I like to think that it wasn't a choice. I, I like to think that it was just what you do. You know, it, it wasn't as though I sat down and thought to myself, do I, don't I? It's just, well, I'm, I'm going to do this. So I, so I left art school, came home, pretty full of the hubris of youth and ego, and thinking, well, I can fix this, not knowing anything about it at all. Yeah, to re return home to be her principal carer. And got thrust into a world that I had no prior understanding of. I, I certainly, I was certainly familiar with her condition, but I wasn't familiar with the benefit system and the bureaucracy that I was about to enter, nor, nor the isolation uh, that comes with it. What happens was time kind of acquires a different um, flow when you go into a situation like this, a day can become a week, can become a month. Before you know it, a year's passed. And in my instance, 15 years just 
slips slips by and you don't notice like the accumulative um stress that it puts upon you and you also don't notice your, your aspirations evaporating it's, it's i think this is something that a lot of carers um feel that it's almost impossible to kind of put your hand up and draw attention to yourself when you're going through it you know i wasn't going to sort of explain to my father you know what happened to my life and i certainly wasn't going to say it to my mum and i didn't know anybody else at this point so I, I kind of just overlooked it days became weeks became years and before i knew it i was in a situation where i wasn't talking i didn't know anyone i just did every day it's like the world's worst version of groundhog day and i realized i was completely lost um there was certainly a period where i was self-medicating to try and deal with what I now know is PTSD um, and social anxiety and all of these kind of things. But I'd, I'd forgotten who I was, really. I, I had There was no escape. I'd forgotten who I was. Out of the blue, an old friend uh, came to visit me and they said, look, I've got this camera. Why didn't you borrow it? Just I can see that you're in a bad place. Just walk around the village and, you know, I know you were always really creative. Have a, have a go, see what happens. And things happened really, really quickly. I mean, the first couple of weeks, um, I just walked around the village and very quickly realized I wasn't that interested in making photographs of sheep or fields or trees. And there was this thing that I used to do where I'd, I'd walk around the block. So I live in a pretty rural village and there's like a square two mile block of, of village lanes. And normally after like looking after mum deep into the morning, I, I guess it would be, I'd, I'd go for a walk, which I still joke about is it in, in that if you want to feel like the last man on earth, do it in the middle of the countryside at four o'clock in the morning where there's no lights and no people. And yeah, that really made me feel even probably more isolated. However, there was one person that I would always see uh, two doors from where I'm sat. There was a house and an elderly gentleman that used to sit in his porch and he'd always be awake when i'd go for these walks it looked like he was living in the porch of his house so it's like a like a lean-to porch it's all glass at the front he's always lit by a black and white tv surrounded by cats and kittens and piles of rubbish he'd always put his hand up to me i'd always put my hand up to him a few days later um I'm walking into town to pick up some medicine for mum. I've got the camera with me, start carrying it everywhere obsessively. Um, he puts his hand up and kind of beckons to me. And I find myself walking up his up his drive into his porch. Uh, I like kind of look at the camera and he sees that I'm sort of saying, can I use it? And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah do what you like. And we just began the most amazing friendship. A long story short, uh, he, he'd found himself in a similar situation to me. His, his wife had passed away. He had no one to talk to. He couldn't face living in the house because it had so many memories. So he just built this porch on the front of the house, moved all the stuff that he needed to kind of exist into the porch. His meeting me gave him an opportunity to kind of unload. And he kind of gave me his life story, told me everything, wonderful stories, wonderful feelings, emotions. And I made some photographs, took the camera into town to a local camera shop before that was closed down, uh, made him some prints and he loved them. We carried on like this for a couple of months. And then really out of the blue, he got diagnosed with cancer, went into hospital, had a successful operation, but caught an infection and passed away. I was devastated because he was like the first person that I'd made a real connection with in a long, long time. This is a guy in his like late eighties. But I realized what happened was he, he'd given me this blueprint of what I was going to do for the rest of my life. I was born with a hair lip, cleft lip, got brought up without a dad. My mum was my rock, my soulmate. Loads of blokes coming in and out, you know, I didn't like because I was the man of the house, I presume. I just rebelled on it been locked up a few times in police cells, went to prison for various offences, driving offences, fighting, a lot. And I went to jail for about 
six months. But I got let out on about three months for good behaviour. Then my mum died on the 4th of Feb 2010. Ripped my heart out. Didn't cry at her funeral, which knocked me for six. She was there for me, no matter what. I could always say that she was there for me. She didn't judge me. Um, the only thing she did judge me about was my cannabis intake. Because I've got ADHD, so it helps with my anger. It helps in loads of ways, you know. It mellows me out. It's nice to not be able to be on edge for once in my life. Before I have it, I want to go out and commit crime or commit something. You know, I just want to be out. Now, I haven't got no money at the minute, and if I wouldn't have been able to get weed, I'll go off and do some crime. You know, so then I can get the money. It's not just for the weed, it's for Kirsty as well, and the dog, and the cat. And it's, horrible. it's horrible knowing that the benefits ain't really helping matters. It's not enough for me, really, for me and Kirsty and the animals, because by the time I paid me water and electric and everything else, me and Kirsty's only left with, what, 20, 30 pound? And that's it, and that's got to get us food, that's got to get us dog food, that's got to get us luxuries, tobacco. It doesn't go too far. I mean, it was literally the months before um, David Cameron was, was voted in. So I was listening to people like George Osborne being interviewed on the radio about their plans. Were they to be uh, voted into power? And one of the first things I remember George Osborne talking about was how they were going to uh, revitalise or revamp the welfare state. I can remember listening to this on a bus on headphones and I shuddered because I knew that it didn't mean revamp. It meant uh, dismantle, deconstruct, underfund. Um, and of course, that's exactly what was then to transpire. It was uh, they were voted into power and thus began really heavy, their first heavy round of austerity cuts. But for sure, when the beginnings of austerity happened, it was affecting people like carers, it was affecting um, our poor, our disabled communities, our children, um, certainly our NHS and, and many groups associated with, with helping people out in the community. But it was this convergence of the conservatives getting in the beginnings of austerity, watching very dehumanising and stereotyping news reports or programming that had just begun to happen, programmes where you were kind of, certainly things like Jeremy Kyle or Benefit Street, where poverty suddenly became entertainment. That, for want of a better word, really made me fucking angry because I didn't see any, uh, you know, I like balance. In, in, in reporting and it would have seemed fair if they'd actually documented how hard it was for people um the, the sacrifice or the selflessness of carers for uh, you know that give up everything to look after loved ones but that wasn't happening it seemed to be very very vindictive certainly in the print media all the headlines were about benefits cheats or people being scroungers and this this kind of gave me this lit a fire underneath me, I think, more than anything. It made, it made me really angry. So the people that I would meet when I was out, I would meet just as I would in, in life. It wasn't necessarily fueled by the photography. It's certainly shaped by circumstance. And that the people that I would meet would be waiting in the queue for the prescriptions that I'd pick up. You know, because I'd have to go and pick up my mum's medicine. So I'd talk to the person next to me and... Well, I'd be in the street and I'd talk to someone at the bus queue or in the supermarket or in a cafe if I'd stop for a cup of tea or something. And it wasn't as a photographer looking for a photograph. I was just really interested in how this was going for them because I knew it was really difficult for us. And pretty quickly I found like a real core network of people that were very willing to talk to me because they knew they were talking to me. I wasn't approaching them as a photographer. I was approaching 
them as me. And what happened was because they saw that I had a camera with me, they'd ask me, well, what's with the camera? And I tell them that I, I had this idea that I wanted to kind of document people's uh, experience of, of right now. They could talk about anything. I was just there to amplify what they, what they had to say. And I was quickly overwhelmed with the amount of people that said yes. In fact, everybody that I've ever encountered has always said yes. I, I then start getting referrals <laughs> where, where people are saying to their friends, oh, we know this guy that, and he'll help you. You know, I know this is happening to you. Do you want to talk to him? And that's what happened. So probably for seven years, I haven't asked anyone to make their photograph. It's all people messaging me or sending me a text. So-and-so says that you do this. And I think it's fueled by this real um, desire that people have to be heard. It's not that people don't have a voice, it's that no one's listening. One night when we were up in my room, he was like rocking backwards and forwards on the bed. And um, he looked down for like a minute or so, then he looked back up at me and he was a completely different person. After that, I decided to get up and go to the toilet and he grabbed my wrist and he pulled me down back on the bed and um, Basically, I looked. I tried to look into his eyes, but you could just see he's got pure evil in them, and that he just didn't care at all. So he he's just a completely different person. But afterwards, he um, he went to go get like a sharpener from like my chest of drawers, and um, he en he ended up taking the blade out, and he kept cutting himself and his neck and his arms, and. Um, Basically, he turned around to me and without a word, he just grabbed my arm and he started cutting me as well. The next minute, like I'd say 10 minutes after, he ended up taking a load of pills and um, I asked him what were they for and he just said, oh, they're nothing serious as such. And um, basically, after that, he was like basically just back to how he was like being like the pure evil side and the next minute I just found out I was being strangled on the bed and I thought well this is it, I thought he wasn't going to let go and then I just went completely blue and he let go in the end and he turned around and said to me that he was throwing his back to himself to this day my mum still remembers me coming down the stairs being like, just shaking and I'd sit down I wouldn't say a word of what happened and everything just came tumbling down and then I started hitting the drugs and the drink um, I got involved with the wrong people as well and um, it just completely messed my life up and I was self-harming a lot more as well because he just played with my mind and I couldn't, I just couldn't get it out of me to like say something to the police and when I did it was too late. The relationships or the building of relationships is really important to me. Uh, it's important for a lot of reasons, one of them being that probably the, the, the most amount of mail I get after people asking how the people are or sharing that they've lived through similar and they, they want to wish support and solidarity which is great because i all the feedback i always feed back into into my community into the people in the stories which is really important because it lets people know that they're not alone you know when you've shared a story maybe about your your sexual abuse or your addiction or your mental health problems and you think you are the only person going through it and i'm able to then say look this person's written and said they've gone through exactly the same they're, they're there for you but the next letter i get after that is quite often by i mean i'll paraphrase the letter but it's along the lines of i really like your gritty black and white photographs um can i come along with you and and shoot some of your subjects um because i really like your gritty black and white photographs and I mean, there's, there's kind of like a two word answer I'd like to send back, <laughs> but, 
but I don't. I always write and explain. Look, you have to appreciate that it's not a human safari. I don't work with assistants. I, I do everything all by myself because it's a very sensitive ecosystem that I, I work in. The trust is there and it's very real because we know each other. They don't know me as a photographer. They, they know me as, as Jim. 80% of the time that I make, I go out to visit someone. I don't make pictures at all. We might be talking about how rough their week's been or how good their week's been. Or it might be, you know, how do I claim for PIP because I've had my disability living allowance stopped or I'm going to get evicted next week. How can I find the money to get a deposit or my dog's died? I can't afford to bury the, you know, all of these day-to-day -day problems, all of the things that a good community should share and help each other with. That's the bulk of, of, of what I do. You know, it takes one fifteenth of a second to make a photograph, but it can take a lifetime to build up trust. So you can't expect to go click and, you know, it's not a VIP pass into someone's heart. Uh, if anything, people would naturally shy away from a camera if you hadn't spent time building a relationship. And I think people sometimes fall into the trap where they think having a camera is enough. That, well, I've got a camera, so you've got to respect me. I've got a camera, so you have to permit me. I have a camera, so you have to acquiesce to my, my demands. Um, and all of that's bullshit. I've got things in common with every story that I've worked on either directly or indirectly and i always share that with everybody it's, it's a it's a two-way exchange of information and experience and pain and, and happiness and emotions just like any other fucking relationship they know that i know what they're going through because i've gone through the same i'm not parachuting into an environment that i am out of context when they tell me oh i can't i can't afford to eat this week they know that when i say nor can i <laughs> i'm not bullshitting them they know that it's not a pretense they know that it's that i understand they know that i understand um because they know my situation because we've shared that because we've got a real relationship it's not photographer and subject because i'm not the king <laughs> you know they're not my subjects they're people that i know they're my they're my friends i love them I truly do like family. And the crazy thing is, is that when you meet someone for the first time, you don't know if you're going to become really good friends. You don't know if you're going to love them like a brother or like, like you're their uncle or like you're their dad or whatever. When you meet someone for the first time and then 10 years later, you find yourself in a situation where you're surrounded by people that love you as much as you love them. And love is the major component to everything that I do. David, who I photograph, who, who had an accident and was blinded, lived with his 86-year-old uh, mum uh, and she died of malnutrition and was left all alone and completely suicidal. Understandably, I would say, had no help at all. And I noticed that his house was filled with books, covered in dust and cobwebs. And I just, this was kind of like the first time where I really in, encountered what I'd call direct photo action, where I wanted to do more with my pictures than just share them and hope to amplify story. I really wanted to make a difference. Um, so yeah, a really long story short, uh, we raised the money in four days, it was just under $4,000. Bought him a scanner that would translate printed material into audio and I don't know, two, three weeks after initially going to David and saying, look, I can try this. I don't know if it'll work. And him kind of going, yeah, okay. I got a photograph of him sat there smiling for what I would say is the first time since I've met him some three years before, listening to a book being read to him. And that's all about community. I know that getting that scanner for David saved his life because before that, I mean, he was just existing in a world of pitch black all by himself. And then all of a sudden he had something that could reconnect him to the world. It's like, if you've got a camera, you're either gonna use it as a, a, a sword and attack people, or you're gonna use it as a shield and defend people. And there can be a massive power dynamic with a camera because you can use it and abuse it 
and attain a level of power over the people that you work with. But if you open yourself up and you, you make work with full empathy, full compassion, full love, full desire to amplify with as little of your ego as possible, you open yourself up. So all of the things that you're experiencing seep completely into, into your heart. I mean, I always kind of had a bit of a problem with some of the machismo attributed to street photography. The machismo, right? The guys that go around just shooting anything because they feel like they've got a right to shoot anything. And a lot of it is punching down. And I really believe in punching up because we have such an incredible opportunity to share at the moment, to share experience. You know, if you've got, even if you've just got a mobile phone, you can be documenting what's happening in your street or your block of flats or your row of houses or your village or your town. And rather than saying everything's great, you can be saying, well, actually, things are really tough. And I kind of feel like it's our moral duty to do that because there's so many people out there that are hurting, but you wouldn't know it. But when you scratch behind the, you scratch the surface a little bit, you realize that most everybody that you know is hurting or, or struggling. And that, that should be the story. I, I suppose the greatest achievement that I've had in all the time I've been doing this was at the last exhibition that I did. Um, the, at the close of it, you, you, I gave a talk and it was pretty emotional. There was a lot of people in the audience that weren't photographers, didn't know anything about photography, but they'd come across my work and they were there because they'd either lived similar when they were kids or they were living the same right now. But at the end of it, what I, uh, at the end of the talk, what I wanted to do was I, I asked the audience to give a round of applause, quickly followed by my saying, not for me, <laughs> you know, I just want to point that out. I wanted them to applaud all the people in the book and they did. And it just went on and on and on. It's, uh, it's on my Instagram. If you go to my Instagram stories, the first story covers this. And it's just a room full of people just pouring emotion into this round of applause and cheering to say thank you to all of the people in the pictures. And I filmed it and then I took it to all of the people from the stories. And I was able to kind of fulfill the promise that I make that I'll get it noticed, that they won't have to feel that they don't exist anymore. So playing back those clips to the people were, I mean, it's very difficult to put it into words, but to come back with, with this kind of proof that people cared, um, I think that's the best thing that I've experienced through, through doing it all. Give that money to ask you all a favour if it's possible, because there's nobody in these pictures that was able to, um, to attend today. Uh, and probably the most important one is going to be David, because he can't see. And I wanted to take the photograph of you all to take back to show everyone, because you're talking about uh, for a couple of questions. What does it mean to these people? If you could all be so kind and gracious as to give me a round of applause. Not I isn't right for me. <laughs> I would be very embarrassed, but I want to take it back to show everyone what their selflessness has meant to you. So, hang on. You think being a photographer right now would work this place? You can tell this when you're ready? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, if I count down from three, three, <laughs> 